Um, the problems that we do in class today, uh, they're basically just old exam problems. So I looked up some old exams, I threw them together in a worksheet, and then I handed it out. Um, I always just make my exams off templates of old exams. <laughs> so your exam problems are going to be very close to this. There might be a few differences, some different numbers and things like that, but um, in general this is going to be a lot like your exam. Just because a problem doesn't turn up here doesn't mean it won't be on the exam. But if you can do all of this without notes and, and you're confident in all of it, you're probably going to get a pretty decent grade on your exam. So. <clears throat> So go ahead and just follow along today, and I would, uh, if I were you, I'd write down the correct process for doing all these problems, and then just use your take-home exam kind of as a template to how, for how to study. Once again, the exam will be um, no time limits. You get a three by five note card. Would you mind um, shutting that window just that last? Like, <laughs> I know it's like the worst spot for me. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so you get the five, the three by five note card. I, you know, like I would put my graphing formulas on there if I were you guys. Point slope, slope intercept, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, question? Scratch that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> no question. Um, <clears throat> once you get, uh, just like last time, it'll be unlimited time. So I'll bring a bunch of stuff to entertain me while I'm up here, and you guys can check your work twenty times if you want to. Um, you're allowed a calculator. But I definitely will expect you to show me at least one intermediate step on, well, on all the problems, but especially on the scientific notation. OK. Any questions? Yes? Do you get one that you're going to cross out? Again? Good question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you get one that you're going to be able to cross out, and you get an extra credit again. So, you know, so you're going to get a little bit of wiggle room on this. OK. To start out with, we are just asked to plot some points. Just what's that? Are you on the right packet? No. <laughs> yeah, like I said, like both these packets are made from previous exams, and so you can see how similar your exam will probably be to this. <clears throat> okay, so when we plot points, we just have to remember that. Points in less labeled otherwise are always in the form x comma y. So our x coordinate comes first, then comes our y coordinate. So with this first point, 1, 4, we go over 1 on the x axis and then we go up 4 on the y axis to this point. So we say that is 1, comma, 4 and we label it. Yes. Uh, you mean like, do you. Oh, you mean like if you're, um, yeah, I, I want you to at least put something on there that indicates what scale you're using. And you should also label your x and y axes, although, I, you know, I wouldn't take points off for that one. It's just good practice. So the point negative 1, comma 1, we go over to negative 1 on the x-axis and then up to 1 on the y-axis. And that gives us this point, negative 1, comma 1. And then the last one, 4, negative 2. We go over to positive 4 on the x-axis and then down negative 2 on the y-axis and we make our point right here, 4, negative 2. All right, so that's how you plot points. Careful with that one. I know plotting points is simple, but people have brain farts on the test all the time and, and mix that one up. So just look over it once to check your work. Because it's, you know, you should all get that one right. All right, graphing a line. So suppose I am asked to graph the line y equals 2x minus 1. I'm also asked to identify and clearly label both the x and y intercepts. Uh, so first I'm going to graph, and then I'll find out what the x and y intercepts are. So I'm in the form y equals mx plus b for graphing. where m is equal to my slope and b is part of my y-intercept. The y-intercept is equal to 0 comma b. So for this particular graph, my slope is equal to 2 because that's the number that's out in front of the x and then my y-intercept 
that is equal to the point zero comma negative one. Okay, so all I need to do to graph this is plot the y-intercept and then count the slope off from there. So my y-intercept is at zero negative one, so I put a point here. And then I count a two slope. Remember, a two slope is really two over one, just like any integer, so we go up two and over one. Two over one. Or I could go down two and over one. Okay, <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and draw my line. So I'm not done yet though, because the problem said I need to clearly label, identify and clearly label both the x and y intercepts. So I know what the y intercept is. That was the point zero, negative one. So I'm gonna label that. I need to find out what this little point is right here though. In order to do that, uh, I do the opposite of what I did to find the y-intercept. Instead of setting x to 0, I set y to 0. So I have 0 equals 2x minus 1, which means I have 2x equals positive 1. And if I divide both sides by 2, I end up with x equals 1 half. All right, so my x-intercept is the point 1 half comma zero. So I just need to label that on my graph. So I say, boom, x-intercept right there. Okay. What's that? What is? Oh, whoops, sorry. <laughs> I was like, what's happening? <laughs> um, <clears throat> other methods you could have used to graph this, I mean, if you just find the x and y intercept and plot those two points and connect them, that's also equivalent to graphing. I didn't say that you had to graph it in a specific way. Um, also, if you, if you like the brute force method, you could have graphed it using that as well, and you would have gotten full points as long as you still identified both the x and y intercepts. Okay? So, no doubt, those first two problems, those will always go on an exam. Right? The only weird things that might happen with these is if you might get a fractional slope, like a one-third slope. So you just got to remember you count one up and three over if that happens. And then sometimes it's not in this nice uh, slope-intercept form when you start. And if it's not, put it in that form and then graph it. Okay. Next. Determine if the given equations are parallel. Write a brief argument as to why or why not. So there are two conditions for a line or for two lines to be parallel. Condition one. Parallel. So condition one, slopes must match. Condition two, y-intercepts must be different. Okay, so with these two examples, or with this example, do my slopes match? Yeah, they're both equal to one half. Are my y-intercepts different? Yes. <laughs> so I meet condition one, I meet condition two. Yes. My argument would say their slopes match, their y-intercepts are different, so yes, they are parallel. Okay. Problem number four. This is another one. This is going to be on there, guaranteed. I give you two points and I tell you to give me an equation describing a line with those two points. That will be on the exam. 
The two formulas you're going to need are these uh, point slope, which is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And then you need to, you're going to need the actual formula for m, the slope. m is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. <clears throat> All right, so my first step is, of course, I write out my equations. Then I go ahead and I label my points to avoid any confusion later. So I'm going to label this x1, y1, x2, y2. So now I have all the information right here that I need to fill out this equation. First thing I do is solve for m. So my y2, that was equal to 10. My y1, that was equal to 4. My x2, that was equal to 1. And my x1 was equal to 2. So this gives me 6 over a negative 1, which gives me a negative 6 for my slope. OK, so I have m. I've already labeled x1 and y1. So I just need to plug everything in, and I'm done. So I have y minus y1 y1 was 4, equals m, we already found m, that was negative 6, times x minus x1. And x1 was just 2. There we go. We are done. Since I didn't ask you to put that equation in a specific form, we're done. If I would have asked you to put it in slope-intercept form, you would have had to solve for y on this step. But since I only ask you to give me an equation, any old equation, you're done right here. OK, that one will be on the exam. <laughs> you like my motion? <laughs> I don't know why that means will be on the exam. <clears throat> OK, simplifying exponents. So simplifying exponents, right off the bat, we can see we have a y to the 0 here. That doesn't need to be there because anything to the 0 is just 1. So now the only thing we need to do is simplify these x's. I'll just use the quotient rule for that. So the quotient rule says we subtract exponents when we're dividing exponentials. So I have on top x to the 5 minus 2. Then the bottom, I still just have y squared. Complete my little bit of arithmetic, and I'm done. And that was it. OK, um, and the same is true. Like, if we started out on some equation and we had, let's say, z to the, I don't know, 10 over z to the negative 2, and then we had x, y, z to the 0, it doesn't matter that those are three different variables in those parentheses with the 0 attached you still would just cancel them all out because they're all just equal to 1. All right? And if you ran into this problem with the negative exponents, just remember we can flip it up to the top. So this would be z to the 10 times z to the positive 2 now because we flipped it up to the numerator. And this would give us z to the 12 in the end. OK, moving on. This one's pretty. <clears throat> So um, with these ones, when I have a bunch of different variables and a bunch of um, numbers and things like that, I like to separate them all. You know, you guys might have your own strategy for dealing with this kind of chaos. Um, but I like to separate everything and just deal with it separately. So I have 55 over 5 times a cubed over a to the negative 3 times b to the negative 1 over b to the negative 3, and then times 1 over k to the negative 22. So I just simplify all these things individually, and then I put them all together on the last step. So 55 over 5, that's just equal to 11. Um, on this next part, the the a, I'm going to flip up this. I have a negative exponent on the bottom, so I'm going to flip it up to the top and make it positive. So that now turns into a cubed times a cubed. What 
with this next one, I'm going to flip both my negatives on the same step. So I have b to the positive 3 over b to the positive 1 now. And then, of course, my k to the negative 22. There's not much else to do with that except for flip it up to the top. So that turns into k to the positive 22 now. All right, now I just go, go through and I simplify things a little bit more. So now I still have my 11 out front times a cubed times a cubed. That gives me a to the sixth b cubed over a single b, what do I get when I simplify that? Good, b squared. Yeah, we just subtract 1 from that upper exponent. So I have b squared. And then k to the positive 22, there's nothing else to do there. And so that's it, we'd be done. So the important thing in those types of problems is just that you're kind of methodical. You just go through it. Don't skip steps. That's where the mistakes happen. Ugh. This guy. <laughs> so um, once again, like you know, just remember for two terms to combine, for their coefficients to combine, they have to have the exact same variable factors. If, if their variable factors are different by one thing, you can't put them together. So we start out with the highest degree terms. I have an eighth degree term here. And I think that's the highest. So I have two of those. 8x to the eighth plus x to the eighth. That just gives us 9x to the eighth. Cross those guys out. <clears throat> My next highest degree term, I can see I have two fourth degree terms. But <laughs> are these two terms like? No, they're not quite like. I, <laughs> I switched the position of the variables in this one to confuse you, but I, I always confuse myself when I see this. <laughs> yeah, so these are not like, right? Notice one of these has four copies of x. The, only, the other one only has one. That's not allowed, so we can't combine those two terms. So, so they have to drop straight down. So we have negative 2yx to the fourth plus xy to the fourth. Third degree term, we only have one, so it just comes straight down, minus 3x cubed. Second degree term, just one, it comes straight down, plus 6x squared. We have a plus x and a minus x, so those cancel each other out. And then we have a negative 3 and a positive 10. So I get a plus 7 on the end here. In a testing situation, you'll definitely want to just go through and sort of maybe just follow all your steps through again. Just make sure you didn't make any small mistakes. Small mistakes really get a lot of people on these ones. Another fun one here. So remember, the only difference between this and the last one is that we have a negative sign in between the parentheses. So we have to distribute that before we add. So everything in this first parentheses, it doesn't have a negative out front, so it just drops straight down. So I end up with 2x cubed minus x squared plus 6x to the fourth plus x plus 4. Now I start distributing this negative sign in, and it switches the sign of all these terms. So now I have a plus 3x to the fourth plus 2x squared minus x cubed minus 4. All right. I go through my process once again. So I see I have some fourth degree terms here. I'm going to go ahead and combine those. 6 plus 3 is 9. So 9x to the fourth. Now I have some third degree terms. I have 2x cubed minus x cubed. That gives me plus x cubed. Then I have 2x squared and minus x squared. That gives me with just a plain old x squared. And then finally, I have a plain old x, and my 4s cancel each other out. And so that's it. <coughs> OK. All right.
multiplying a couple polynomials together. So, no doubt you guys watched the entire lecture and you did everything I asked you to do throughout the lecture. So you're good at this FOIL stuff. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I don't demand that you use FOIL even in this. You can use any technique you'd like that we learned. Um, I, we're on the special products section though, so FOIL is usually where I go for this one. So F-O-I-L. The F stands for the first two terms in each binomial, so I multiply those together and I get x squared. The O stands for the outer two terms, so I get plus x. The I stands for the innermost two terms, minus 2x. And then the L stands for the last two terms in each binomial, so that's negative 2. Then I just need to combine my like terms, and that leaves me with x squared, uh, oops, that's not a plus, x squared minus x minus 2. <laughs> Can you guys see this right here? No, it's a frowny face. It tries to interpret my handwriting. And it, it puts it on these tabs over here as I go. And it must interpret this as a big frowny face. Because there's like a frown face emoji right here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm easily entertained. Next problem. <laughs> okay, so ah, this is a division problem. Um, this is another one. Like, you know, this problem always goes in there. And always it always has two sections. One section, we're dividing by a monomial, right? Which means there's no pluses or minuses inside there. And then the other section, we're dividing by a binomial. And so we have to use long division. OK, so when we're dividing by a monomial, we split up the fraction. That's the important thing. And so uh, what we do is um, we just recognize that when we're, when we're adding things together, let's say a over b plus c over b, if we have the same denominator, we add numerators and keep the denominator. Well, for this problem, we're going to do the reverse of that, right? So we're going to go in the other direction, right? We're going to reverse this and go back to the beginning. We're going to split this up and have a over b plus c over b. All right, so with this one, I end up with 2x squared over yx cubed plus, right, the plus sign comes from the numerator, just goes right in the middle of your new terms, plus xy cubed over yx cubed. Okay, so now we just simplify each of these fractions separately. In this first fraction, there, you can't really simplify the 2 or the y, so we just have to simplify the x's. Um, so we cancel two x's on the top, and we cancel two on the bottom to leave us with just one x. So the first fraction turns into two over y x. The second fraction, we cancel one x, right? So I, this three drops to a two, and then we cancel one y. So this three drops to a two. So that gives us y squared over x squared. And then we're done on that problem. <clears throat> that only really works because there was no plus or minus sign in the denominator. That would be a much more strange problem if we tried to do that when we had a binomial. So let's, uh, let's hit this long division example. So when we do have just a plain binomial like this, um, we use long division. And the long division is very similar to the long division that we use on integers. So the way that this works, if you guys missed the video, is we select the two leading terms in each of our polynomials. <clears throat> and we say, we say, what do we need to multiply this term in yellow by in order to get this term in blue? Right? And the yellow term is, is always from the divisor. The blue term would always be from the uh, dividend. 
So I say, what do I multiply x by in order to get x squared? Well, that's just x. Now I take that new uh, term that I wrote up there, and I distribute it back into the divisor here. So I multiply x by x to get x squared, and then I multiply x by 8 to get plus 8x. Now I take that line that I just wrote down in red there, and I subtract it from the line above. x squared minus x squared is 0. 9x minus 8x, that gives me just a plain old x. Now I drop the next digit in line down, or the next term in line. <clears throat> and then I start the process over again. So I say, OK, this is my new leading term. What do I need to multiply the term in yellow by to get the term in blue? 1, yeah. Is it a plus or a minus? Plus. So you write plus 1 here. Don't forget that plus sign. <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't quite make sense. All right, now that you have the 1 out there, you do the same thing. You multiply this 1 back into your original uh, divisor, and you get x plus 8. Subtract this from the line above. And since we have 0 here, that means we're done. And since we have 0 here, that means that this is the answer, x plus 1. Now, if you want to check your work on an exam for this, multiply those two things together and make sure you get this third thing in blue down here. Right? And so in an exam, if, if you're saying, well, I'm not sure if x plus 1 is correct, this is all you need to do is a little bit of scratch work on the side. You say, well, if I multiply them together, x plus 8 and x plus 1, what would I get? Well, you'd get x squared. For your outer term, you get plus x. For your inner term, you get plus 8x. And for your last term, you get plus 8. When we put those terms together, we get exactly what we wanted. And so since these two match, we did this correctly. Any questions on that one? No? Hmm. See, on this one, this one it thinks I said I wrote tote somewhere in here. I definitely didn't, though. <laughs> oh, whoops. This one's blank. That's not good. Here, let's see if it actually reads my smiley face. It's not reading that. Well, I think this software is weak. All right, keep going, sorry. <clears throat> okay, so problem number 11, which I believe is the last one you had there. Did I just skip some problems? Okay, good. Just making sure those two blank pages did not, were not supposed to go anywhere. Um, so now we are doing some scientific notation. And just remember, you're going to want to uh, make sure you know how to do the middle step on this one. So for scientific notation, we just multiply the two coefficients together then we multiply our exponentials together and combine them in the end. So I have 3.2 times 2.0 up here. And then I'm going to say all that multiplied by 10 to the fifth times 10 to the negative 2. This is your intermediate step that is, or something like it. Okay, so I multiplied my two coefficients together. That gives me a 6.4. The x stays in the same spot. And then I just combine my exponentials. And so remember, since my bases are like here, all I need to do is add 5 and negative 2. So that gives me 10 cubed. Okay, in this next example, <clears throat> oh, um, usually when I ask you to multiply in, um, there we go, 
So I say, place your an answer in scientific notation. And so we left it in the scientific notation. Um, we could take it out, yeah, but. Yes, that's very annoying, I know. I do not like that x, because x should be a variable. But that's the way they, they have it, so. All right, so now with this next example, uh, we basically do the same thing. So we say 3.2 over 2.0 times. Uh, and for this step, yeah, maybe I'll just leave them like that. 10 to the fifth over 10 to the negative 2. So that could be your intermediate step. So this leaves me with 1.6 times. <clears throat> what would this give me? What do you guys think? Good. Yeah, exactly. 10 to the seventh, right? Because that negative 2 flips up. And then you have 5 plus 2 on the top. So here you go. And I got to have something like this, some sort of intermediate step. OK. <clears throat> OK. Any questions? Can we leave yet? <laughs> Is that the question? Um, OK, honestly, you can leave. Uh, <laughs> that went pretty quick. Uh, I will be in my office for the rest of the day. If you guys want to bring your practice packets in and work anything out, just remember we do have that exam tomorrow. So, goodness gracious, you should go work on that and then study this. I have off tomorrow, so I'm going to study. Are you okay? Huh? Right, here, let me.